Cause you might sound hopeful. Everybody, welcome back to the Beyond the Peloton podcast. I'm Spencer Martin from the Beyond the Peloton newsletter. I'm here with Andrew Vontz from the Choose the Hard Way podcast for a special rest day, second rest day edition of the Tour de France. Andrew, do you want to say a quick word about your podcast before we get into it, though? There's no rest for the wicked, and that's certainly the case for this podcast today, Spencer. I cannot wait to go deep on what is happening at the Tour de France. Choose the Hard Way as a podcast about how hard things build stronger humans. Come check us out everywhere you listen. Choose the hardway.com at Hardway Pod on social. This week, we're dropping part two of the Allison Jackson interview, which I think might be dropping in this feed as well. I am still working to persuade Spencer, Spencer to join me in a um, synchronized dance with Allison Jackson for Instagram. We're choreographing it as we speak. Stand by. I'm sure uh, Allison's busy preparing for the tour and would love to join this um, Instagram collaboration. So watch out for that. And then uh, just drop Mitch Docker last week, Brim Bookwalter, Peacock, NBC tour commentator the week before. So come find us, check us out everywhere you listen. Choose the hard way. Well, thank you. And let's, well, what's the first thing, the last time we recorded, I think was the last rest day. It was a 17 second gap, I believe, between the top two riders, Jonas Vindegaard, Tadej Pogacar. Flash forward a week, it is 10 seconds. So not much has changed, but everything has changed. I mean, what's your big takeaway here, Andrew, from this week of racing we just watched? The main thing, I'm, I'm trying to recall if there's ever been an actual three-way battle for the general classification. Yeah, that's a good question. Sure, in my lifetime, because I'm, of course, thinking about this fantasy scenario where Remco Evenepoel is in the race, and would we actually have a three-way race for the GC overall, or would it just end up being a two-way tie again? And I think the main thing that's on my mind, actually, is just the psychology of winning. Mitch Stocker talked about it a lot in our interview for Choose the Hard Way. You know, watching Jonas and Tade go toe-to-toe, man, they just seem so evenly matched. I feel... Like, this is such a treat to see two competitors at this level, at the extreme of human potential, so closely matched. And you just have to think that the mind is the margin of victory in this race. Yeah, I, com- I completely agree. And it's funny that, so they're really close, 10 seconds. You go down to third. Carlos Rodriguez, five minutes and 21 seconds behind Whew. Jonas. But then it's actually pretty tw- tight from three, four, five. But if you think... You know, like you're like, wow, this is so it's a two way battle, a long way down to third. If you remember back to the Froome years, it was like this, but without the other guy. It would just be Chris Froome, Roman Bardet, five and a half minutes down. And we would just be deluding ourselves like, well, if Chris Froome is abducted by aliens halfway through the third week, this could be a race. You know, we just had to like tell ourselves stories. So I'm really glad we're not there. It is interesting that you do tend, I, I actually don't know if I've ever seen a third rider stay in the mix that's kind of a a funny thing but maybe you'd imagine it's more of a mental thing than physical because there has to be this race specifically there's probably only two riders that are at the level those guys are just so much better than everybody else it seems like anytime Pagacha attacks he puts a minute into the third rider and can't drop Jonas Vindegaard I am really really impressed and you know, I, I spent the week up in Aspen with uh, with Mr. Lance Armstrong, and he can't. He's a big Tade Pogacar fan because Tade is probably the best writer in the world um, across the whole calendar. What do you like? How do you square this circle where Tade is so good, he gets to the tour, and he seems like he cannot drop Jonas Vingegaard at least meaningfully so. And to me, it just seems like Jonas is, a, is has superpower of just being able to like take punches, like you could just beat the crap out of him. He's going to beat Tade on one out of 10 courses, but the nine that he loses, he can just keep it so close that, you know, he can leverage that into three week success. It is really hard for me to explain to someone, well, this guy, he, he'll never beat Pogacar in any other race except the biggest race of the year where he's seemingly unbeatable. Like, how do you square that, Andrew? It seems like he has that Enios diesel quality to him, but he can do it at seven watts per kilogram. Yeah, he's doing diesel at right? like some of the most explosive powers you could imagine. Yes. Yeah, because we're used to in the high mountains there being these explosive moments. We've seen Pagacha do this where he does the very the big wind up, the big attack, 
gets a gap. And then, yeah, Jonas is there. The Elastic's just going back and forth. And he claws his way back. And he really does seem to be using a strategy that we've seen Enios perfect over the years, which is when your rival attacks, you just stay probably floating above your threshold and you just tap the pedals and just slowly work your way back. And it's, you know, it's kind of strange to see coupled with Pagacha did seem to lack the ability to, you know, do the second portion of usually he has the big attack. Then he attacks again and he really opens up the gap when he does actually open the gap. He didn't do that yesterday. And I mean, I think we need to remember also this guy broke his wrist. What? two months ago, like we're talking like he came into the race fresh and had a, a normal workup leading into the race. He was probably on my whoosh for six hours a day in the weeks leading up to the race. So he just, he didn't have a nor normal buildup. So it's not, it's not quite the same, right? You know, what's crazy about that though, faster than he's ever been. Like he's torching his best times on all these climbs. Like they went up Grand Colombier. I think it was like 90 seconds faster than when Pagacha won in 2020. Like he is just smoking his times from these climbs. So it's almost like the broken wrist has left him in better form. And if he hadn't broken the wrist, he maybe wouldn't have distanced Vinegard on those other stages. Like a stage six, you're talking about the second attack. He attacks Jonas, pulls out time, finishes 24 seconds ahead by the finish line. It does seem like Jonas is big, big, big asset physically is in the third week at high altitudes in the Alps. It's he's, he's better than at least not, maybe not better, but he then can close that gap where Pogacar attacks. He can't open it. Jonas closes it. They come to the line even. I mean, I think this thing, do you think this comes down to tomorrow's time trial or are they just going to push that as well? Like there doesn't seem to be a lot of fitness difference between them. I think it's going to come down to chance and a random variable, such as the crash we saw yesterday with Sepp Kuss and uh, Nathan Van Huydonk in the spectator. I think some aspect of chance is going to be the winning margin for whoever ends up winning. And I mean, the other thing I thought about with that wreck yesterday, I'm sure it was on your mind, Spencer, coming into the tour and then throughout the race, we've definitely been talking on this podcast about it's the strongest rider with the strongest team. Part of having the strongest team is having your riders healthy, staying off the ground, staying in the race. It seemed at the outset that UAE had the weaker team. What did you think yesterday? I mean, this definitely complicates things. But let's just say that, I mean, the time trial, another thing Mr. Lance Armstrong believes is that that's just going to blow up in the gaps. Like, we're just going to be a completely different race after that. I think I disagree. I, I do think it's going to be pretty tight after this time trial. I don't see these guys being that different. Stage 17, hardest day of the race. I might be, this might be just a dream board of mine, but I think it's still pretty tight after that. Stage 20 in the Alsace region. I mean, this is, we go back into Pogacar country a little bit before we go into the final stage. It's like lower altitude, shorter climbs. That is, could be tough. Like, let's just say it's a 10 second gap still going into there and Yumbo has to defend and they were banged up from that crash yesterday. To me, that's where that starts to get messy for them. Like, could they really contain Tade Pagachar with a 10 second deficit on a tough stage through like low altitude mountains the day before the race ends? Uh, that's where I think the crash could, uh, could come into play because stage 17 is so, so hard that. I think it almost doesn't matter. Like Sepkus would be, maybe Sepkus is there, maybe he's not. That That is a big blow, but on Col de la Lowe's, it's really just going to be Tade, Sepkus, Adam Yates, Jonas. And like we saw yesterday, okay, Adam Yates, they, they tried some like voodoo tactic where it's like, oh, we're sending Adam Yates off the front. What are you going to do now, Jonas? And he's just like, well, I'm going to let him ride away because when we stand up, we're going to pull the guy in and he, we're going to close a, a two minute gap in 30 seconds because we're that fast. But I do think stage 20 could be tough. I kind of think, I mean, is it crazy to think we go into stage 21 and the gap is less than the time bonuses available on the stage and we see them sprinting it out for the overall win and we see the tour reduced to like a local criterium? I mean, as you know, Spencer, I've been deep in the UCI rule book looking at what the rules are when you have an actual complete lock tied overall time. 
And, uh, you know, that led to some interesting conversations. Everybody talks about this fantasy of the Champs-Élysées turning into an actual meaningful stage. I just kind of can't imagine a scenario where that happens as much as I would like to see it happen. And going back, I, I also hate to be in the position of being a crash predictor. But if we take a look at the tour last year where we had a near Pagacha wreck on that descent, I can't recall which stage it was on because they were so evenly matched. They were pushing each other, I think, back to stage 14 on Saturday where there was that moment when Jonas's wheel, I don't know what happened, if it was a braking incident or he hit something on the road, but you saw some unexpected lateral movement of his rear wheel. And I know I texted you during that descent. I thought someone was going to crash for sure because they were attacking each other on the descent. And then you have, you know, C-Rod coming over the top of everyone with the knockout blow. Uh, and then, you, I mean, also in that descent, Tade misjudged that line, which is what enabled C-Rod's gap to open up and to the actual loss of the stage. So I'm just seeing a lot of moments where these athletes are at the very edge of their extreme ability and a highly fatigued state and accidents happen. And again, I hate to be a crash predictor, but we have seen some gnarly crashes in ITTs and it could be a factor in tomorrow's race. I really no, hope not. I'm not going to crash. These we've guys, seen it. guys like don't really crash that often, but we've, we've seen it happen before. Who knows? We've also seen never say never bomb drop. <laughs> never say never. <laughs> Never say um, never. I, I do think Tade can't descend because if you, when you go back to that stage you just referenced, Jonas wanted Rodriguez to win the stage. That was like best thing for him because it took the 10 second time bonus off the table. It meant the most Pogacar could gain was a two second delta between second and third place. And it would give Jonas the one second advantage for the stage. So Jonas wants Rodriguez to stay away. Tade has to start winning stages if he wants to win the overall because he needs time bonus seconds. He just screwed up. That was like a junior mistake. Someone comes over the top of you at the top of a descent and you don't get on their wheel. Like, what the heck was he thinking? And the guy was slow. Like, he was creeping down that descent relative to what someone that's been pro for one, two years, like the second youngest rider in the race. That, and if you go back to the Tourmalay, he couldn't really descend that well in the Tourmalay either. I would think that goes back to maybe the wrist injury, as you yeah. said, being on, on my whoosh all the time, not being that comfortable on the bike. You know, that. I don't know if he's going to crash in the time trial. I actually don't think either of them crashed just out of probability, but we do have a just downhill finish on stage 17. You know, that could come into play if he can't keep up with, with Jonas on that descent. Do we want to talk about C-Rod for a moment and the rumors he's going to movie star to ruin yeah, his career? I can't career? stop thinking about this. <laughs> I, it's like dominating my thoughts. Yeah, I've had a lot of thoughts about this because we can talk about the, the movie star scenario. And then I'm also hearing chatter like, oh, there's no way... Enios is going to counter. They're going to keep him on the team. If he stays on Enios, the most probable scenario is he becomes a mountain super domestique supporting Pidcock, who it's pretty clear they're trying to turn into. Wait, do you think that's that's realistic? Because he's clearly the, the team's best GC rider. I mean, this guy's a superstar. And Pidcock they, is not a GC rider. But they, I think they really want to have a British tour winner again. That's the feeling so, that I have. So this would explain the decision. Right. Like that's, yeah. that's what I would think. So I think that's why he's probably leaving the team. If they retain him, I think even if they told him, we think you're our best shot at winning the tour de France, we're going to build the team around you. Can you imagine a scenario where Pidcock is going to be a full on support writer, not doing wild like things that don't undermine the ability of Enios to potentially win the tour? No, I mean, he even jumped in the break yesterday and he wasn't supposed yeah. to be and they called him out of the breakaway. Um, it wouldn't go up, but you're probably right. But if Enios can no longer, they've just been dying for a top tier Grand Tour contender for since 2019. They finally right. get one, a budding young star, and they're going to lose him because he's not British. Then the, as the Brits would say, that team is not fit for purpose. Like, well, what's the point here? You You are only interested in, G British GC riders, but then the two British GC good riders you have, you don't even send to this race. Like, like Teo Gegenhardt and Garen Thomas can barely get chances to race for themselves at the tour. And is it really just Team Tom Pickock and they're all in on that? And if you're not Tom Pickock, we're not interested in retaining you. Like that's crazy if that's the level it's gotten to. 
I could see that being the thinking within the team. And then I see the scenario where C-Rod stays on the team. They either tell him, we're going to go with the dual leader approach. And a lot of teams have actually done that. Like, we'll let the road decide. Great. We know that's not going to work out well, particularly within that team. That guarantees another attempt to go for yellow helmets for everyone versus actually winning the race. Or, you know, we're going to get three people in the top 10. Great. But you're not going to win the tour. So it's that or it's they re-sign him, they pay him Seb Koos money, and it's your, you know, your Oh, I think he's getting 5x what Koos makes. Okay. And I think then he's you're gonna, a five, you're, six million dollar year man. Okay. So and we're gonna keep you as a mountain super domestic. And then do you want to put out five to six million euros to have somebody just be a mountain super domestic for Tom Pidcock, who just wants to go race uh who, mountain bike world cups who's and, never gotten a result ever in a stage race but yeah i mean it's it's stupid but you're probably right that is probably the thinking right and then if he goes to movistar he's done i mean he'll be he'll get top five one or two times and then 10 years will pass and he'll be leaving the sport pushback on that <laughs> a little bit of pushback in enric moss has done okay for himself at i would actually say enric moss is like maybe maximizing his potential at Movistar. I do kind of worry about, I just saw like a headline that gave me like PTSD where it's like Rodriguez to join Movistar, form new Trident. I'm like, no, we don't need more. Tri Get rid of the Trident era. That was terrible for Movistar. When you have three crappy riders, that's not a Trident. That's just not yeah. having any good. It's like the football saying, if you have three quarterbacks, you have no quarterbacks. Like they just need a leader. And like Rodriguez is that guy. I do see it being a little tough with, Enric Moss, because in his mind, he's the superstar. He's probably the best rider in the sport in Enric Moss's mind. So I don't totally understand how he fits in there, but it's got to be better than Ineos and working for Tom Pickock, who will never get a GC result. Because as you say, he likes doing other sports and other things instead of racing on the road. And as we've talked about many times before, when I watched the C-Rod post-race interview, it was almost like a child had been handed a... Uh, like a stealth fighter to fly and they were capable of flying it and did some amazing feat. I'm not sure how that transposes into, we need you to have the maturity to lead a team to win the tour de France. They're very different things. Like it's such yes. a different, it's such a different psychology. And I don't know, he could be a highly mature and capable leader. Garrett Thomas has been talking about, Rodriguez specifically on his podcast and had a lot of nice things to say about him. Does, does he have, does he never, uh, this is maybe me just reading into something that's not there. Does he never seem that excited about the team doing well when it's not him? No, he's talking so much shit about the team, which <laughs> I, I love. I mean, I love it. I'm clearly he's an extremely, he's extremely bitter at this point which is fair. It's amazing podcasting. I can't believe we yeah. get to listen to it. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. If you're not listening to it, I think it's a must listen during this tour. And yeah, but he, he does have nice things to say about C-Rod. Apparently he was, I was just listening to the Garrett Thomas podcast this morning and C-Rod was like an engineering student his first year on the yes. team. Pretty yeah. impressive. We're, yeah. we're potentially forgetting a big, big variable here. And that is the rumors that Remco Evenepoel, a year after saying no to Ineos, is now suddenly concerned that he's not at the, he's just realized that the Tour de France exists and he's not at it. What? You didn't tell me this was a race, Patrick Lefebvre. And he's concerned about the team, concerned that they're not good. Uh, no one quite knows why now he's concerned, but he wasn't concerned 12 months ago and wants to sign with Ineos this time when he didn't sign last time and might be leaving with immediate effect. And then that would clearly hurt Rodriguez. Uh, Rodriguez does not want to be on a team with Tom Pickock and Remco Evenepoel. No, thank you. So that would explain you know, wanting to, to go to Movistar. My theory is that Remco found out the tour was happening and that he's not at it by following the social media feed of Average Rob, who is a Belgian <laughs> YouTuber. If, again, if you haven't checked out Average Rob, his stuff's pretty interesting. He did an episode like a behind the scenes with Remco. He's also done one with MVDP. You get to see a bit of the personalities of these seemingly uh, just totally stoic writers. Remco has a 
you know, he has a bit of a personality, uh, definitely different than what we've, how we've seen him portrayed in the media, but that would be my theory. He saw some stuff on Instagram was like, hold on, average Rob is there. And I, I didn't get to go to this race. Look at all these people at this race. Yeah. What I think I'm going to need to, going on? yeah, I think I'm going to need to change teams. Wow. Those motorcycles stop right in front of the riders. That's incredible. Some of them that have was two awesome, wheels in the front. The <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> Yeah, when that when that happened and Pog had to slow down, I mean, again, like going back to Chance being the margin of victory in this race, I know many other people have talked about this. I think that had he put in that attack at full strength as he intended to do, I think he would have put some serious time. I don't buy that. Also, dude, you are you looking at the motos in front of you? Like, I, I think it was almost like a TV attack. Like, oh, oh no, look, you think oh, this is there in front of me? I tried to get away. Do you think this guy attacked Thomas right into the back of Come motorcycles? <laughs> but they can just hit the gas, you know, clear he, the he crowd, got, part the Red Sea. He got smoked at the top of that climb. You well, know? he'd already he'd already put in a big dig. I mean, you know how it is, Spencer. Oh, you've, you've been down there at Tulsa like, Tough. If you'd like opened up, second. if you'd opened up three laps out, and then on lap two you had to go again with a full strength attack, like, do you think you'd be able to hit it the same? Hmm. I mean, there's, it definitely probably shouldn't have happened. The tour is getting a lot of crap for that. But I also feel like like the NBA, in the NBA finals, like you can dribble, dribble, pick up your dribble, start dribbling again because the ref has forgotten that you already dribbled and picked up your dribble. And like they just don't call that because the refs don't have the attention span to remember that, which is crazy. And no one talks about it. And like just things will happen in an open course sporting event. I mean, they probably should have put barriers, but when there's no, I think that's on, on Tade. Like there's no barriers here. There's people standing in front of the road. This moto is not going to be able to go. Like I need to maybe not attack right here. I, I think that's on him. Did the ASO need to have a photographer there at that moment no. in time? They, right? No, but if there's no moto, they're not going anywhere. Like they're just going to run into the, the crowd. I think the, the reason the moto is so close to them is because if, they go further. The crowd yeah. goes in after the moto and blocks the riders. Yeah. So the moto is there basically to break up the crowd because if they don't have a photographer, I think that I don't think they would have made it through. Yeah. Because drunk human sees moto and says, I should move. Drunk human sees 120 pound cyclists and it doesn't register the same, perhaps. And then the riders just probably would be running into the fans. Yeah. All right. So I still think he would have gotten a real gap if he'd been able to open it up, wind it up and continue when he initiated that attack. I also would say some part of me was hoping that we would have a Froome running moment. Like I was hoping that these guys were going to have to get off and run. I, yeah, I thought about like skipping the last few K of yesterday's stage and just like rewatching right before I recorded. And I was like, man, but what if we get a Froom running? Like, you just never know when it's going to happen. Yeah, you, you can know. never leave the TV. Um, Froom, yeah, the Froom running, I was actually thinking about that. Funny to think that he thought he could not have his bike. I still can't quite wrap my head around that. Like, I'm Chris Froom. I don't need the bike. They will be fine with this. Like, well, that's kind of the fundamental point of the sport, Chris. This is not running. This is a bike race. You probably need a bike to cross the finish line. For those not familiar, Chris Froom crashed. Similar situation, actually, to the Tata Jonas human crush situation. And his bike was run over and he just panicked and ran away from the bike to cross the finish line on just his feet. It was insane. But should we talk about just let's talk about this Ineos quick step situation. Remco wants to leave. Patrick Lefebvre, who kind of. I feel like says too much. He came out denying that the team had been sold, that his quick step team had been sold to an anonymous American investor, which makes no sense because what, if you're going to buy a cycling team, you're, it's just a license to write checks. You just do it for your own publicity. There's no point in buying a team and it not being public. But it did, it, I found it odd because it raised the possibility that there's actually no oversight on team. Like you and I could buy Ineos and then we could buy Quick Step, and we don't have to disclose any of this. We could buy every team in the sport, and then boom, we control the sport. And I was thinking, oh, well, you know what would be if you really wanted Remco Evenepoel, if you were Ineos, just buy the team. Don't buy the rider because they're going to demand some massive buyout clause. Just work around all of this by buying the license, 
and then you can shut the team down and take whatever riders you want. And it turned out that thought experiment was exactly what's happening, where Dave's Bra- Dave Brailsford is definitely trying to buy Quick Step and just take Remco. I mean, it's complete madness. It, the price tag that I saw for the team was sixteen million dollars. Is that the price you saw, or is that yeah? That seemed, very, that seemed, seemed low to me for a team with well, their. Do you know what it sold for the last time they sold it? Six million dollars. One dollar. Okay. So, so sixteen is quite the increase from that. That's a good you, ROI. Yeah. You don't have any assets. That's the reason the team wouldn't sell for very much. I mean, the, there's not. You're just buying a liability. You're buying. The right you're buying the right to pay the riders through the rest of their contract, so that's the reason I think sixteen is is would be way too much. I, I don't even really know what the assets would be. I would only pay that if you got the bikes included because with bikes costing like fifteen grand, maybe you could sell two hundred bikes for like four million bucks. When I saw but, the price tag, I started making some calls. I thought about of thought about forming an investment cartel to see if we could just purchase it outright. My main motivation was I wanted to get the licensing rights to do Patrick Lefebvre bobblehead dolls. And I would hand those out at all the big races. And then you're just going to make the money that you're going to make the money back right there. Yeah. But it's, it's not a licensing, clear to me. It's a licensing play. It does kind of make me think the team, if we're even hearing about all this, something's not right. And, and I was even saying to a, like a prominent Belgian commentator, that I'm like, this is wild. They're not bringing Remco to the tour. Like, won't the sponsors not be happy that they brought this dog duty team? They can't do anything to the Tour de France. Pretty big race, you could say. And he's like, no, 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 the sponsors are locked in until 2026. Like, they're more than happy. Clearly, that's not the case. Like, if they are worried about money at this point, I, I do wonder now if the sponsorship situation is solid and why are we even hearing about this? Why is Remco suddenly concerned about the future of the team when, as you pointed out, he is the future of the team? Maybe Remco saw the new Tarmac SL8 <laughs> that has that nose cone and was like, I can't ride this bike. I'm out. Yeah, yeah I'm out. There's, there's a possibility. It's really the only explanation. But do <laughs> so you think, just to, to bring us back to the Tour of France, you think this is decided by a crash, not on the road? Yeah. Well, that'd be sad. Well, now I'm bummed. Yeah, it would be, yeah, it would be super, be super sad. It'd be a real sad face kind of thing. But uh, yeah, there's just been a lot of stuff going on in this tour that I'm not, I'm not really understanding. I didn't understand. Wow. I mean, you noted this in the newsletter today, but why was way, why was wow spending so much energy I don't in know. that break yesterday? And then on stage 14, I saw your take on this, Spencer, that, um, and I wonder if you've reflected on it and have further thoughts. But when Wout finished his poll on stage 14, it looked like he was blown. He dropped. And then he just drilled it back to the front. Do you remember that moment? Oh, yeah. 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 Do you think this was a rope-a-dope? Was this like some of the I t- tactical brinksmanship that we're starting to see, like with Yates at the end of the stage? Or what do you think was going on? I think he's, I, I thought when I saw it and I was watching the race with George Shinkapi, who disagrees with me on this. So someone who knows what they're talking about thinks this is not a good idea. But I thought Sepkus was, you can see him radio. The moment Adam Yates comes to the front, or no, Rafa Mike comes to the front, Sepkus yeah. gets on the radio. And something UAE does is they'll get to the front at the, at the base of climbs and go really, really, really hard to like mentally trick the Yumbo domestiques into thinking, well, this is too hard. I'm dropped. It drops the Yumbo domestiques after about a kilometer. They ease off the pace. Now they have a numerical advantage. Yumbo riders are out the back. Sepkus, in, in my theory, sees this coming. He immediately gets on the radio the moment Micah comes to the front. Wout drops with one other rider. Um, I forget who it is. Maybe Dylan Van Barl. And I think Sep was saying, like, don't go, don't go, don't go. This is a bluff. Wow, hears that as he's doing is like stand still and then comes back to the front, pops Micah to keep him from, you know, performing the rest of the bluff. You could argue, though, after more time, having more time to reflect on it, maybe just let Micah keep going. Like, what is the problem right. with that? Because then isn't Micah, the whole point of the stage was for Yumbo to set the hardest possible pace to zap Pogatra's leg so that when he inevitably attacked, 
it wouldn't be as powerful and then Jonas could follow. So wouldn't you just want Micah to stay on the front? That's the only thing where I wonder, maybe this wasn't really, really thought out. And then I think Wout did come out and say, there was no point to that. I just wanted to go hard. <laughs> Which seems to be the theme of the tour. He's, he's like, why is he, why is he driving the brake yesterday? That makes no sense. What was he thinking? Yeah, I don't know. There's just a lot of nonsense. But I mean, we've seen this on, we've seen this on both teams. And again, going back to where we were at at the beginning of this tour, Yumbo was the superior team, and it seemed like Pagacha was getting that free lead out in the mountains. He would just sit on their train. And then when it was time to go, he'd hit the afterburners. And now we're seeing a scenario where it's kind of flipped. And UAE has the stronger team at the end of these climbs. And Pagacha has a support rider when Jonas doesn't. Jonas is isolated. He's back in that Ineos diesel mode. Well, Adam Yates has been, I mean, better than any of oh, us. Oh, yeah. Imagine. It's been the phenomenal. I, yeah, I know I talked a lot of smack about him at the beginning of the tour, but wow. It's it's been pretty incredible. I still don't think in another scenario where he's in the actual leadership role for GC at the tour on another team, like I, don't, I still don't think he could ever do it. But I'm impressed with his ride for sure. But I didn't think a, he'd be here. Yeah, looking a gift horse in the mouth. Here's the slight problem with Adam Yates doing so well. He's probably going to get third. He's a good time trialist. He's 19 seconds at a third. So. The only way Adam Yates becomes a problem, he's five minutes and 40 seconds behind Jonas. So if he attacks on a final climb and, T and Tade is like, hey, chase him, Jonas is going to say, no, thank you. I, he's not going to gain six minutes on me. So the only way that he becomes a problem is if he attacks at the beginning of a stage and really panics Jumbo Visma. He's not going to do that because if he just rides a really conservative race, puts time into Rodriguez in the final climb, does well in the time trial, he's going to get third. That's a big result. So now that he's doing so well, they can't deploy him as some sort of chaos option. He's just basically going to ride his own race now. He's going to be around Tade. You saw yesterday Tade drop a bottle on the final climb right before the, you cut the feeds yeah. off and you can't get a feed. Adam's right there, hands him a bottle. Like that, that is valuable, but that's really the only value he can serve at this point because he's in a bad position where he's so far out of first, but also so close to third that he's not a threat to Jonas on final climbs, but he's so close to third, he won't attack before a final climb. That scenario makes sense. And you bring up in a point that I had in my notes for the last pod we did, and we didn't get to it. Where are you at with this no feeding on final climbs rule or no feeding in the final K? Why can we not feed and water these athletes? Well, when, yeah. I think we saw it yesterday when... Uh, I think his name is Chris Nealens. Good rider. He's on the descent into the final climb. I don't know what he was thinking. Yeah. And he pulls up to the Vettel bike and tries to get a bottle and just really right. went down hard because he's trying to ride next to a motorcycle on a twisty descent. I think it's partially not to have the chaos of riders' attacks going on final climbs, riders trying to grab feeds from the side of the road and then causing crashes. Like, do you remember when like Rigoberto Oran took a bottle during the sp a sprint, like an uphill sprint during a tour? I think they're trying to keep that from happening. And also people would just hold on to cars because you would, your car would yeah, pull up true. and you would grab a car. I think that's what the rule is for. I do find it a little odd though. I th almost think it should be like a like you can take feeds from the side of the road until yeah. you know, what 400 meters to go or something like that. Yeah, that would work for me. If you have somebody on the side of the road, if you have a Swanee on the side of the road handing out bottles or gels or whatever the case may be on a final climb, I don't like why would we have a problem with that other than I guess you're probably going to have human interference from drunk fans in bucket hats. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think, I mean, the, a guy did die at this race because he was like taking meth on the final climb. Um, maybe they, it was like an issue in the past where riders would like just get amphetamines on the, in the final climb and that this rule yeah. was meant to stop that. Yeah. Angel dust could be. What, what could go wrong? What could go wrong? Yeah. I, well, yeah. I, <laughs> we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be making light of this. But yeah, don't take angel dust or methamphetamines yeah. means when you're yeah. in a bike race. Don't take PCP in a bike race. It's a banned Even substance. If it was the, uh, the norm for a while. Also, so Jasper Phillips, and I just want to talk about this. 
The guy's going to win the Speaking points. of PCP, yeah. <laughs> He's going to win the points jersey. It's not even close. I looked at the route today. He could win three more stages. We could be looking at a... He already has four, right? So he could win seven stages right. at this tour. That's unbelievable. Yeah. The thing that's most amazing to me about Jasper's pursuit of the green jersey is how little interest I have in it. I'm just, it's, I'm realizing it only matters to me when it's attached to someone with a big personality and they're, I don't know, like during the Sagan well, era, yeah. wow, right? Like, and it was cool know. when like Cavendish would have it, a completely different rider, like Tour Hushoft is trying to get it. Yeah. And Cavendish can't climb, Hushoft can climb. So Hushoft's losing points on the sprints getting into mountain breakaways that and same thing with Michael Matthews and Sagan where like when guys have to get really creative to get points I think that's the only place where it's interesting right same thing in the the mountain jersey KOM competition we saw Chicone take it now right and I mean like yeah. I just the whole race I felt like this moment's coming this this isn't gonna well, last you know who's gonna win it sure enough Who's After win all it? of this, Jonas Vindegaard is going to win this jersey because he has a six-point lead on Tade Pogacar. Usually, whoever wins the state wins the overall wins the points wins the KOM jersey since they've retooled it and actually count big climbs for a lot of points. I think it, let's just assume Tade goes over like the HC climbs in first. He would probably win. He'd probably win the race and the KOM jersey. But if they even like split that. Jonas is just going to win this on accident because Col de la Lowe's on stage 17, I think that's worth 40 points. And Chicone currently has 58 points. So you assume Tade and Jonas are one, two on that climb. It's like 40 points and 36 points for first and second. Jonas is probably going to win this. And then you wonder, was that worth it for EF to kind of tank Palace's race to hold polka dot for what, like, 14 stages you got to do it do it all for the bucket hats whatever it takes you got to go all in probably for i mean there is wisdom in your in, in your point there where for the casuals if you're not really paying attention and you just see polka dot bucket hats polka dot whatever on instagram it probably grabs your attention more than a single i mean wow has got maybe a second of tv time for his stage win yesterday did you see that yeah, yeah. <laughs> they didn't show him at all <laughs> and they like flashed to it and he's like crossing the line they flash back but then like oh french guys coming in third we got to get this guy on yeah for at least a minute yeah it cut back to a couple of ag2r riders getting dropped like 15 minutes back in the race you know speaking of riders we haven't seen get a lot of screen time what do you think about egan bernal in this race He's sitting at 32nd and an hour and 36 minutes down. Is, is he done? Is he going to end up in a Froome type situation with this contract where team management is speaking out against him? He's definitely in a, he's definitely better than Chris Froome. Like he can, well, we don't, work. we don't, I mean, let's hit pause on that. We don't know. We, Froome, Froome is not at, be winning this race. Froome is, Froome is not at this race, but he says he could have been a contender at this race. True, true. I do love that tactic of not actually competing in something and then claiming that you're better than everyone who's doing it. Um, one of my all-time favorites. Uh, I, he definitely can offer work. I just think it's going to be a rough road back. I think I just didn't like the whole narrative when he got in the crash in the first place. And if you remember, he was having problems before the crash. Like 2020 tour, no one quite knew. Remember the back was a problem and it's like, well, he can't really ride his bike in the more anymore because his back hurts. And then he yeah. ran into a bus going like 45 miles an hour on a TT bike. And that probably didn't help his back. And so I just didn't like the narrative that like, he's going to come back and he's going to be contending. And it's like, well, he wasn't really contending before the crash. I think if he can come back and just be like a rider on an Ineos Tour de France team, that that's pretty good. I mean, if he can be a mountain domestique for uh, Tom Pickock getting 15th place, that, that's something. Why do you think we're seeing Froome have this very public fight with management about his future in the team? Do you think it's they, because, well, I mean, do you think it's because Froome genuinely believes like I'm coming back and I am going to lead the team at the tour in 2024 and they, they want to make sure he doesn't do that? 
that's what that's I love that thought. I just wrote it off as like, what are ninety nine percent of arguments about money? They're paying him five million euros a year, and he's not good. Um, th- I think that in their mind, they're aggrieved because they think the honorable thing to do would just for him to retire and forfeit the rest of that payment that he's not fulfilling his contractual obligations by being bad at cycling and he should not be continuing to collect his paycheck. As I always say, I, I'm pro labor. I think you signed that contract, buddy. Pay up. Chris Froome, keep getting those checks. Um, but I think that's what it's about. There, Sylvan Adams is just mad. He has to write Chris Froome what well, must be a massive check every month. Yeah, and Froome is not going to walk away from that deal. No, nor no. nor nor should he. Who's going to leave five six million euros on the table? I think he has mean, two two more years on the contract. Live it That's up, Chris. Not Live an it up, Chris. Significant amount of money, but that is funny to think that yeah, they're trying to scare him off the team because they don't want him to try to come back. Yeah, <laughs> next year and go to the tour. Yeah, I, I like the theory as well. Um, what what do you think about Jakobsen to DSM? And I'm just thinking again. I'm thinking about this. Rimco, I think most likely he's going to try to get somebody to buy his contract out. That then becomes a question of what team actually has the budget and infrastructure to support him making a legit bid for the tour. And if he's stuck at quick step, you know, what's going on there? Jakobsen has indicated I'm out because the team's moving in a different direction. Um, you know, we're going to stay friends, but we're going to start seeing other people. He's headed to DSM. Alaphilippe is definitely getting nuked. <laughs> I mean, uh, oh so, God. right. So I'm, I'm so disappointed. I don't, I want to know if, I want to see the behind the music five or 10 years from now on, like what's actually going on with Alaphilippe. There's something going on there. It's not good. I would guess so too. And he seems like a nice guy. So I feel bad for saying these things. I have high empathy for him, but things have feel like they've fallen apart for him. Also like watch him win worlds now. That would be very <laughs> so, I mean, he's just not who he used to be. He's clearly struggling with it. It's not clear to me why the team knew this and thought, I just don't, I don't understand. We talked about this the last podcast. I don't understand the whole strategy with Evan Napole. It's, it's fictional to think that a rider wins the Giro Vuelta and then goes to the tour. That just doesn't happen. Like that's not a progression that works. So I don't know why they're sticking to that. I don't know why they would bring out Philippe. I think his father died around the time that he started to get really jumpy on the bike this was like a year and a half ago two years ago and then he started crashing a lot because he was so jumpy on the bike so that's probably just personal turmoil that has caused the drop off but okay you bring up a good point so if we're hearing about Remco wanting to leave let's just assume he's gone and he's probably going to Ineos Jakobsen's leaving I thought that was weird that that came out during the tour because he's one of their only good riders currently Ala yeah. Philippe is probably not staying with the team after what Lefebvre said about him. What does that leave them? And it's not a lot. And then now you wonder, would the sponsors really stick around for that? Like, we're going to pay you all this money to have Casper Askren, who's a nice writer, be the superstar? Maybe they signed C-Rod. That would be hilarious. <laughs> That's where you want to be. Forging your GC career, C Rod. Um, I kind of it's it's wild. Probably be better it. be better than Movistar. It's true. I think Movistar. I think Quick Step has one Grand Tour podium in their entire like twenty seven year career as a team. I don't know. Is it is Movistar? Are we giving Quick Step a pass? Like they're well. I'm, they're okay. One, let's, they're one of the worst teams in this race. Let's let's talk about Matteo Jorgensen. We know he wanted off the team, and we talked about why he was paying for some of his own training out training outside expert consulting to work with him in addition to what he was getting from the team. That's again, we talked about this. That's quite normal in professional sports. LeBron famously was spending a million dollars a year on all of his recovery stuff. So people do this in sport, and it did sound like he really wasn't getting the development and support that he needed from the team. So he was like, I'm going to elevate my performance as high as possible so I can get the hell out of here and get on a team where I actually have the support I need, have the writers around me that I need to realize my full potential and get past fourth or second place. 
Yeah, the weird thing about Mateo, that's all correct. And obviously, he said he's not making any money this year because he's spending as much on training camps as he's making. That's clearly not sustainable. Movistar is bringing in, this is not like news. This isn't official yet. I'm just telling you it's going to happen. Movistar is bringing in the Saudis to fund the team. So that's how they can afford to pay Rodriguez more than Anios is willing to pay him. Wouldn't Mateo be like second in line to get a bag from them? Like he's yeah. probably their best rider currently. Sure. I think they could have offered him a, a pretty good package with, I don't know, the Saudis seem to have some money, I've heard. And now he's going to Yumbo where he's never going to be able to win a race. So I don't quite understand the, the move away from Movistar, except if he holds them in the same esteem that you do, that, that would explain that. Yeah, and it's also funny to me that we talk with reverence about Yumbo and UAE as if Tade and Jonas are going to perform this way in perpetuity. I'm now thinking about Egan Bernal, Froome, Garrett Thomas. It just seems, I don't know how you feel about this, Spencer. Maybe it's just that I'm older now, but I feel like tour winners used to be on a permanent pedestal. They were they were like monuments of the sport into onto themselves. And it just doesn't feel like that anymore. And I think what feels like it's going to last forever, as we've seen over and over, rarely lasts. Like look at Wout in the tour this year versus last year, or Matthew Vanderpool in the tour this year versus last year. And I feel like guys like C-Rod, who knows who's next, are coming up and they could, you know, pull a Tade or a Jonas and come from seemingly out of nowhere and be a tour winner. It's definitely a valid Concern. I will say with on in regards to Wout, I think he we have nuclear Wout. Like he blew up the Peloton on stage 14 on a mountain stage. Just like I'm gonna get on the front and this Peloton's now eight riders. That's unbelievable. Yeah, that was, pr- it, was like, it was pretty good. All right. I've never seen anyone do that. <laughs> the difference with Wout this year is it's these small mental mistakes. Like, do you did you notice if you go back to stage two, he's just sitting on his teammate's wheel, Benut's wheel, who has nothing left, and that's why he loses the sprint. Right. Same yep. thing on stage seven or eight where he's just sitting on the port he gets swarmed where it's like man last year you were just making those decisions snap snap decisions so to me that's more of a mental thing but yeah the Jonas situation does not feel sustainable in my mind like the way that he has to he has to shave every like gram off his body he has to ride the perfect race to be 10 seconds ahead of Tade Pogacar at the second rest day of a tour where Tade was had a broken wrist. So that feels like a that feels like a Tom Dumoulin lifespan to me. Okay, going back to those two stages where Wout blew the sprint when he clearly he had a high chance or a high probability of winning if he'd played his cards right. Thinking back on 2022, was he ever in a scenario where he actually had a proper lead out from a no. teammate dedicated that's what I'm saying. I don't think yeah. that he has the pattern recognition to operate in in a uh in this new kind of environment where he has actual support, he seems like the kind of rider in a sprint who thrives on chaos and wheel surfing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I don't know, maybe that's just kind of new to him. And speaking of sprinters, you know, Caleb Ewan also in an open war with management now, (laughs) like what, what's what's going on? I mean, they're talking about him, about his mental health is what it seems like, or at least that's how Caleb's, uh, agent is trying, that's the narrative Caleb's agent is trying to advance is that his sponsor is attacking his mental health and calling him mentally weak and all of these things. What do you Which think? You it, I mean, <laughs> yeah, much word for yeah. word, what he said, I do think yeah. that's a good point where while it's one of the uh rare writers where the lead out the team help has hurt him, um, yeah. with Caleb Ewan, I, I guess that something that is potentially relevant is the old team manager was like. Caleb Ewan's cheerleader. He's fired last year. New guy comes in, and now new guy's the one that's nuking him in the press and calling him basically a wimp. The guy can't cut it, doesn't have the mindset. So he must, my theory is he sees Arno DeLee and thinks, well, this is our sprinter of the future. Caleb Ewan complains a lot, a lot of team support. Like, you know, he was dropped on stage. What stage was that? Stage like, Stage every stage? Yeah, 12, 13, 14, fill in the blanks, like dropped immediately. And the team has to drop four riders back to pace him alone for the whole race. 
that's going to hurt morale in the team because they're thinking, come on, man, you can't just stay in the back of the peloton in the Gruppetto. Like, let's, let's stop doing this for this guy who never wins. And when you're demanding that much from your team and you stop winning, it's probably pretty tense. I don't quite understand. I didn't understand it with Sylvan Adams either. Like, why are you nuking your rider uh, publicly? It just seems like bad practice. I mean, it seems to me, again, going back to this, just being saber rattling to create some kind of leverage and his contract is his contract. Perhaps they want someone to come in. They want him to seek another team so that yeah. they can get out of the contract because they can't break it because the employment law there favors the employee, right? So it would be very difficult for them to dismiss him, even though he's not performing. Kind of a Froome. I mean, as you said, it's a bit of a Froome type situation. So they're doing every nasty thing they can just to make him walk. And they probably know there aren't going to be a lot of Caleb Ewan buyers right now. I mean, maybe he goes to uh, the Denver Disruptors. I have no idea. <laughs> His like, old lead out man is there. Yeah. It's but like I mean. Impossible. Yeah. And I think something people forget, and I only remember this when I listened to that Bobby and Yen's interview with Caleb, which was excellent. And if anyone connected to Caleb is listening, I would really like to have Caleb on Choose the Hard Way, or maybe we could do an interview with him here. Super intelligent guy. I actually didn't realize that he was one of the first of the generation of riders who uh, more or less was being recruited by world tour teams and supported when he was a teenager. He was like 15 or 16 when he went to Europe and he was getting not direct support, but informal support from Enios, like the training staff management, they would flow him. He broke a bike in a race. They gave him a bike, you know? So he's been at this for half of his life now at this level, pretty much. And I'm just wondering what's again, similar to Alaphilippe, what's going on with this guy outside of racing? Cause if he had the fitness to come, you know, within inches of winning a stage, he got second at a stage in the tour this year it would seem he would have the fitness just to get through the race. And I know it's very hard for sprinters. Again, this is, it's not an easy thing just to complete the race, but yeah, he's getting dropped like 400 meters into the race every day. Like what's going on mentally. I mean, you bring, so yeah, you bring up a lot of good points. That is probably, he has a contract for next year with, with Lotto. So they're clearly trying to get him to leave the team. I, I personally would not say anything publicly. I would go to him and say, where you're not racing any race of significance ever again. Do with that information what you will, Caleb, and then let him kind of privately go look for a new team. I don't like this weird public battle, but I've noticed the same thing I, with like Tom Dumoulin. All of his major results, or almost all of them, came in a 24 month period. You know, you think of Tom Dumoulin having a long career, it was really just two years where he's winning. Same thing with Caleb Ewan. I mean, every major race, every major race win came really between 2018 and 2020. You know, you might just, maybe, maybe that's like the new thing in modern cycling. It's so intense to be at the top that you fry out after a few years of winning and only like the all-time greats can just keep winning after that. Yeah, that, that could be the case. And I, I am curious, like what team would potentially pick him up? Would he go to a French team? I mean... Do we see Not, him on a, Ajitu well, R? We, we crap on these French teams a lot. Kofidis has two wins at this tour. Yumbo has yeah. zero. So, yeah. like, yeah, that's, that's true. pretty impressive. But, yeah, like, Ajitu R, I, I, don't, I don't know, because they value stage wins so much. Right. I would almost think that's worth it. Like, yeah, pick them up. What about Sam Bennett? Wouldn't you think the same thing where well, if you're we total don't know. energy? Yeah. yeah, there's some, yeah, I want to know the behind the scenes on yeah. Sam Bennett and what team management like what do they think about what's going on there and i also think like human powered health would be yeah like, maybe just take a flyer on, on one of these guys no bring in ewan he could be a lead out man for scott mcgill <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, scott finally gets gets yeah. the support he deserves i saw an instagram post over the weekend from someone who did a crit with scott and over the weekend and Scott rode 90 miles to the race and then did the crit. And I don't think he rode home, but I was like, I mean, that man deserves a Caleb Ewan lead out at the Baltimore crit or whatever he did over the weekend. Yeah. That's like, because he was telling us these crits are too easy. You know, he doesn't, he's getting out of shape during these crits. He needs to yeah. get a workout in before. It's like, yeah, I, I went to a race pretty far away 
I, I bet 45, 50 miles. And it was a long race and got there. And Tom Zerbel had ridden his bike there and then rode home. It was, uh, it was pretty, uh, pretty intimidating, I'd say. So maybe that's what Scott was trying to do. Just psych everybody out. What, what are you hearing about Go Do? Um, I, I, I just, I just stopped the you know, conversation. <laughs> <laughs> he seems to be dropped at the start of any time it gets hard. He's immediately dropped, but then he doesn't actually finish the race that slowly. I don't quite understand what's going on there. Like he's still Could, in ninth place overall. Right. Could he be the new Tebow Pino? He's definitely trending that way. And you know who looks actually pretty good? Tebow Pino. He's no, who's yeah. no longer the Tebow Pino. Yeah. He's the old Tebow Pino and I, now he's a goat former or about to be one. Uh, I can't believe he's doing, he came to this race to win stages and he's in 13th overall on, on accident, essentially. Like yeah. It's, he's, he's had some signature Pino moments when he starts his attempt to bridge the break and then gets with no mad chance at of everybody. Yeah, no yeah. chance of winning too late. Yells at people. No one is thinking about this in the entire world, except perhaps me. What would happen if Nairo Quintano were at this race on some of these climbs? He would be, I'll tell you exactly where he would be. He would be about where Sepp Poos is in sixth place, nine to 10 minutes back, I think. I think they're probably about equal climbing ability. I mean, the, that's the shocking thing about these top two guys. They stand up, like Simon Yates having a pretty good race. Simon Yates is almost 11 minutes behind Jonas. Like, that's unbelievable. So I think anytime the pace got hot, Naira's out the back and potentially Naira's even dropped. Did you know Yumbo Visma, their, their tempo on these climbs, 5.5 watts per kilo. When they get to the final climb, six watts per kilo. I think you might be seeing Naira getting dropped at the, t like at the tempo because that was a problem in his later in his career. He, right. would, he just wasn't big enough to put out these huge watts right. that these you know, lead out trains can do on these mountains. And he was kind of struggling to keep up sometimes. Yeah. That used to be one of the really fun things about watching racing in the high mountains before everyone could put out six and a half to seven watts per kilo in the final 20 minutes of a race was you would have a rider like Quintana. I feel like Carapaz had a bit of this riding style and it's almost irrelevant now, but they, yeah. uh, Contador was very similar as well, where they just had that ability to be explosive over and over again and there was a lot of alteration in rhythm as people battled yes. on the stage which was really fun to watch honestly i i kind of miss it it was a very visually compelling style of racing it was really dramatic and now i think training and nutrition have made the athletes are just too good you, you do know? see it at like lower levels like volta catalonia or something you'll, you'll see right. glimpses of that but no it's a really good point and yumbo's strategy clearly has been like some a female professional cyclist was basically yesterday saying, like, these guys are wimps. Just attack at the bottom of the climb, Pat. I put mm -hmm. five minutes into them. Like, Van Vluten, what are you doing? But right. I think what that's not taking into account is Yumbo gets these big guys. Like, naturally, I bet a lot of these guys would be 200 plus pounds. So, like, they're as tall as you, Andrew. They're huge. Right. And they get the, they're just like, okay, so we have a plan. We're not going to eat ever. So you're going to be 150 pounds, but you're still going to put out, you know, 500 watts at your threshold. And we're going to sit on the front. And that's how we pace at six watts per kilo. You're not attacking off of that. If you attack off of that, they're going to reel you in. Because yeah. Contador, when he would attack, his goal was like hold six watts per kilo. Like if you listen to old radio things, it'd be like, cease, 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 cease. Like it was just his director yelling six at him, like to hold six watts per kilo. So they would just reel him in, spit him out the back. That's why you don't see anyone able to attack low on these climbs because as you say these guys are too good almost and the pace is too high you don't see riders have the bad day anymore and i mean i didn't mention this i think that's another factor and teams having their own nutritionist and their own chef and their own cooking facility that follows them to every hotel that also is kind of just a lot of the random variables that would ruin a race for a contender are kind of gone. You're not getting, you're not getting food poison generally because you're controlling all of your nutrition really tightly. You're sourcing your own food products. You're not going in the hotel kitchen. You're not interacting. Well, I guess you are potentially interacting with hotel guests, but you know that people tend to eat 
as much as they need to eat during the race. They're doing 120 grams of carb throughout the race. Who knows if they're doing ketones or not. So you don't have riders just randomly bonking unless it's like we saw with Tade last year, which I guess is a pretty high profile counterfactual to the argument I'm making. Big time? Tom Pickock on Ineos. Oh, yeah. What was that about? I don't know. Do you think, is that what went down with Pickock? That's what, yeah. I mean, he clearly is that, is that what sources are familiar se- Second to last climb, I thought it was a bonk because he was trying to eat on the descent. Like, when would you ever eat on the descent? The official party line, the Politburo's claim is heat stroke or heat sunstroke was right. the was the official line. I think it was a bonk, but they could just be. You know, he seemed like cross racers tend to be. Jeremy Powers was this way. Like, I think yeah. he actually had ADHD. And they right. have a hard time focusing during road races, and it's probably tough for them to remember to eat. Yeah, I had a former member of the GB national team uh, who left it. I don't know. He was probably like in his spars when he left. But one of the things he said to me was I couldn't – I had him on my podcast. He does something else now. But one of the things he said to me was I couldn't continue as a pro cyclist because I basically felt like I had to remove my brain from my head and just like sit on a bike for six hours a day and then put it back in when I got off. So there is, I mean, there are also, to be fair, there's a lot of thinking, this is a highly skill oriented sport, but there's almost either like a meditative quality or you just have to totally shut down certain parts of your brain and you have to be highly attentive to things like you need to continually eat every 15 minutes or whatever, yeah. or you're going to have a bad day, Spencer. If you have a short attention span, it could be tough. I mean, that as you, but you're right. Like you don't see many people bonk probably because the science has been, it's just been boiled down to a science. They know when you're going to bonk and they can preempt it. And you only see it with like personal mistakes or the race is just so intense that your mind is occupied elsewhere. Sure. Yeah. Or the, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the writer, but the writer yesterday that collided with the three wheel motorcycle on the descent. Cause he probably was so hot or so hungry. That he's like, I don't care. I need this water yeah. or food or I'm not finishing the stage. And from what I understand, one of the two front wheels of the motorcycle hit his wheel. So he misjudged something. Uh, he also, um, I heard, you know, Vauders has, he's gotten a lot of airtime in a lot of different places during this tour chapeau, Jonathan Vauders for self-promotion. Is that the sponsor out there to have the coach of a team commentate on a race that the team is in? Hey, he's uh, he's riding his unchained wave. I'm sure he's going to be a big character in season two. Setting aside uh, whether that's well, not on his should... not on his part. He should definitely yeah. do that. I just think yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. GCN doesn't at least have a disclaimer about that. Well, I mean, they're not journalists. That's like, they're absolutely not journalists. They're just people talking about a bike race. But if you were watching an NBA game and you just were listening to the people talk and then you found out the next day that one of the people talking was actually the coach of the team that was playing the game. It's a little, it's a little different, but I mean, that's always been, you know, you turn on Peacock and they're spending 15% of their talk time talking about the Americans in the race. Let's who, go back to this interview with Nielsen Palace at the beginning of the stage. Yeah, like, no, as not. Yeah. We don't need to. Yeah. yeah, I guess some people have a high degree of interest in that. But one of the things I heard Vauder discussing was the... I I'd Actually, I thought about this the other day because if you're going to the volcano, and we know that a lot of these writers are particularly the climbers, climbing GC, domestiques, and GC riders, you're not going to be heat acclimatized when you come back to sea level to go to a race where it's like 100 to 105 degrees on a lot of the stages, right? So <clears throat> I think that might actually be the next frontier of human performance and professional cycling. And I they may already be doing this. I know triathletes create high heat environments indoors to train in. Which are, it involves stuff such as turning on a space heater to maximum in a sealed room or some triathletes will train in a room with the dryer but running with the door open. I will say, so triathlon, you go do Kona, yeah. probably the same temperature. You're not going to get snow or anything like that. Where I think this gets tricky, I think Vodders is onto something that not, no one is heat acclimatized because of these altitude camps. The yeah. tricky thing about the tour, you could be a 105, 105 degree day in Bordeaux it could snow on you in four days in the Alps. And does that heat training, you've seen people, I'm sure you've seen people like Cali boys come out 
it right. drizzles a little and they fall apart, like physically cannot function. And I do wonder if the heat training just makes you physically shut down if it does get cold on you. I think that we're going to see people doing both. So I could imagine on the volcano having a heat acclimatization environment where they're training indoors after an altitude session. And I don't know, maybe they pump oxygen in there. I have no idea, but I bet that this is something that's being explored and we're going to see deployed in future races. Don't you think just like living in, it's also maybe a case for what used to happen is people would probably live where they raced. Yeah. And like, could you just, yeah, maybe the altitude tents don't work though. Maybe that's what we learned earlier this year. Yeah. It's a, yeah. I I've looked into some of the meta analyses. There's some conflicting data about this. It appears that, you know, you don't get that atmospheric pressure, which is one of the factors that leads to some of the benefits that you get from altitude tents. So, yeah, I mean, that's why everybody's going to live on the volcano as much as possible. Speaking of the volcano, Spencer, I'm going to have to head out to go to my personal volcano here shortly. I've got to go too. Perfect yeah. timing. Yeah. Well, Andrew, thanks for joining us. And we'll, I don't know if we'll be back before the race ends, but we'll definitely talk to you. Bef- well, we'll talk to the listeners at least about the race shortly after. If, if oh, it's absolutely. Ended, if not before. I wouldn't miss it for the world. Yeah, I mean, you could still have a Chris Room late entry. Caleb Ewan comes back, wins the final stage in Paris. We we might need an emergency pod if that happens. Yeah, Caleb Ewan, superstar. We'll do it. All right, well, thank you, and we will talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.